Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel and I'm very excited to share my new budget for the new year. I love the new year and I love the months leading up to the new year because I feel like it's such a good time to reflect and reset. This time last year, I was really excited about planning my money goals for the new year that I wanted to achieve and I was also working on getting this YouTube channel started. In preparation for 2023, I want to share how I'm planning to budget for the year ahead. I made a similar video last year and you may have watched that one already but if not, I highly recommend watching it or re-watching it because I'll be referencing that first video a lot. And you can also see how my budget has changed from last year to this year. There is also some stuff from the previous video that I won't be repeating in this one. Another thing before we start, I'm using a new template for this budget and as usual I'll be sharing the link to the Google Sheet for free. So after you watch this video, you can find the link to it in the description box below. It'll be a pay hit link but it's free, but if you wish to support and donate a dollar or two, I would really appreciate it. But no worries if you don't want to pay, it's completely free to download and you can share the link with your friends also. I just want to have as many people get started on the right foot for the new year and help you get your finances in order because life is hard enough and we all need what help we can get. Okay, that's it for my sales pitch and I'll get started on the video. Before we start, as always, I want to start with some background on myself. This would be very familiar if you have seen my previous video and not much has changed. Firstly, I'm a 26-year-old female Singaporean. I've been a full-time salaried worker for three years now and I'm the sole income earner for my family and I'm fully supporting myself and my mother. I'm also the homeowner of a two-room HDB flat. If you're wondering how this is possible, I have a whole detailed video about it on my channel. I'm not planning to get married or have children. This is relevant because it won't be factored in my current budgeting plan. Finally, I have no high interest debt, but I have a student loan and a mortgage that I'm paying off. I'm very excited to share that I'm officially a full-time employee and no longer on contract, which means I got a pay raise and also some health insurance. My starting salary as a fresh graduate in 2020 was $3,000, which was then increased to $3,200 after 6 months and for the rest of 2020. Then for 2021, it was increased to $3,250. In 2022, I got another pay increase and my salary was $3,500. And now, finally, in 2023, my salary is $4,000. It took a while to get here, but we got here eventually. Besides just having more room in my budget, there are a few other benefits that are specific to my circumstances. The first one being that I don't have to make cash top-ups to pay my HDB mortgage anymore. If you remember from my previous videos and monthly budgets, I pretty much cleared my CPF Ordinary account when I bought my two-room HDB flat and my monthly CPF contributions to my OA is less than my monthly mortgage amount, which basically means that I don't have enough CPF to fully cover my mortgage payments every month, so I have to top up in cash. So now with a 4k salary, my OA contributions are about $920, so I can fully cover my $904 monthly mortgage payments by CPF without topping up. This is a huge relief, and I'm so glad I reached this milestone. The second main benefit is that I have hospitalization insurance covered by my company. So for as long as I'm working there, I'll have hospitalization coverage. And yes, I know I should get my own private insurance and all, and trust me, I'm working on it. I had a pre-existing condition which meant that all my applications for hospitalization insurance has been rejected since 2019, so I've just been praying and hoping that I won't run into any serious medical issues for the past three years. So at least now, I have this temporary safety net of my company's medical insurance while I continue to apply for my own private hospitalization plan. And I also have dental coverage, which means I don't have to pay out of pocket for most of my regular dental appointments. Another minor benefit which I thought was mind-blowing was that my salary comes in early, as in before the month even ends, my salary is credited. Because I was on contract previously, I would have to submit a timesheet at the end of the month and then my pay would come in 5 days later. So for example, my salary for October will come in on 5th November. So for the first 5 days of each month, I'm always budgeting in the negatives because I haven't actually gotten my salary yet. According to all my friends who work in government or private companies, this is apparently a given, but you know, I've never experienced it, so I'm still in awe. It's not a super big deal, but it really helps with my cash flow, and it really helps me to stay one month ahead with my budgeting. 
which I've been doing anyway since I started working. So for example, I use November salary for December expenses, December salary for January's expenses, and so on. On top of my base salary at my full-time job, I'm also working on side hustles throughout the year, and I'm hoping to be able to continue that in 2023. My goal is to make at least $500 in side income from various side hustles, which will bring my monthly take-home income to 3.7k each month. Because side income is highly variable, there will be some months where I won't have side income, so this is more of a goal than a given. I have many other financial goals that inform the way I am budgeting for the new year, so if you would like more context, I highly suggest you check out my Money Goals 2023 video, which was my last video. I'll have it linked in the description box below. All that aside, I'm really excited to share with you my new budgeting framework for 2023. The main difference between this budgeting framework and my previous one is just that there are more categories, but the idea is still the same and even the percentages are mostly still the same. For this particular framework, I followed SAF Finance's 41212 framework, so it's 40% necessities, 10% short-term savings, 20% investments, 10% insurance, and 20% ones. I didn't follow it exactly though. I took the numbers and the categories and adapted it for my own needs. I kept the 40% needs, 10% insurance, 20% investments, but I switched the ones to 10% and the savings to 20%. It's not much different from my previous 50-30-20 budget because my investments are still at 20%. I decided to make insurance its own separate category so that I can be more mindful of keeping it to the 10% recommended limit and I've also decided to make once its own separate category and give myself more room in my budget to spend on whatever I want. I feel like I was really strict on myself in 2022 because I had goals that I wanted to hit. But now since I have more money to work with and more space in my budget, I'm giving myself more breathing room to enjoy and not be so hard on myself. With these numbers in mind, I've relooked at all the list items in my budget and adjusted the numbers and I'll go through them one by one. My base salary is $4,000 a month, which means my CPF contribution is $800 a month, making my take-home pay $3,200. With my side income from various side hustles that I'm doing, I'm hoping to earn $500 a month, which will supplement my monthly income. So with all of that, I have $3,700 a month to budget. The first and biggest category is my needs category, which contain all the basic living expenses. I'm still paying off my student loan from uni and that's $100 a month. I don't have to top up my HDB mortgage payments by cash anymore, as I mentioned just now, so that's a huge relief. Also, I explained in much greater detail about CPF in my previous video, so please watch that video for that particular CPF section if you're interested to see how CPF played a role in my budgeting last time. I still pay the same service and conservancy charges, which is $30 because I live in a two-room HDB, the USAFE rebates waive some months throughout the year, which is very helpful. My phone bill for myself and my mother is $15, and my home Wi-Fi is about $42. Electricity, water and gas has gone up quite a lot since last year, so I'm budgeting $100 for both. Thankfully, there is still the USAFE rebate, so some months it will be covered. Next, I'm putting aside this amount for my monthly tax payments. I've paid my taxes in full for 2021, but I think for 2022's taxes, I'll do the monthly payment plan where I pay in installments every month since it's interest-free anyway. I'm putting this here as a placeholder, but from January to March, there won't be any payments yet since the notice of assessment only comes out around March to April. I also have my NTUC union membership, which is $9. I'm topping up $150 in my mother's bank account every month, and I also pay for her insurance. I'm putting her insurance separate from mine because I consider it a separate expense from my personal insurance. I'm budgeting $100 for public transport and the occasional taxi ride here and there. I have a joint account with my partner that we use for shared expenses like meals, entertainment, things like that that we frequently do together, so that's $140 a month. Then for household spending and groceries, I'm budgeting about $350 in total. Household spending refers to things like cleaning supplies or random tools that we need around the house. Usually for transport, household spending, and food and groceries, if I don't end up using all of my budget for these categories, I will move the remaining money into my sinking fund, which means that the leftover money I can use for whatever fund spending I want. 
And that's generally going to be my philosophy with any leftover money. If I don't use up all my budget for any category, or if there's government subsidies like the use vouchers that cover my utilities, the money would just be redirected elsewhere. If I'm feeling like I want to put it towards my emergency fund, I might, but usually it goes into my fund spending. I mentioned this philosophy in my money goals video. Next category is insurance. Very straightforward. So far, I only have a life policy that I'm paying. I'm still working on getting hospitalization insurance for myself, so hopefully I'll be able to fill that gap soon. Next category is wants, which is my sinking fund. Sinking fund is just a term I use for the pool of money that goes towards fun and frivolous expenses because those expenses will be sunk costs. It's a huge upgrade from last year and I think it's pretty generous for my spending habits and lifestyle. I'm also taking language classes as part of my effort to continue learning new things outside of work and that is about $130 a month. Next is savings. I'm in a pretty comfortable place with my emergency funds right now so I'm pausing my contributions. I was really aggressively building this up in the last two years, so I'm taking it slow for next year. Medical fund is also okay for now. I have it separate from my emergency fund just as a buffer for those smaller medical bills so that it doesn't eat into my household spending, and I just carry over the balance into the next month if I don't use it. Next is my medium-term sinking fund. The reason for having this on top of my monthly sinking fund is because sometimes there will be big ticket expenses that I cannot predict or gifts that I'd like to get for people, and there's not enough money in my monthly sinking fund. This also doubles as my sinking fund for high spending periods, like the year-end sales season, where I do a lot of my big ticket spending. For instance, if I'm looking to replace something that is very expensive, I might wait for the sales season so I can get it at a discount. I'm saving $300 a month for my holiday fund, which is a pot of money dedicated to my goal of having at least one or two holidays throughout the year. I'm putting it in Stash Away Simple Plus, which is a cash management portfolio, which has a projected interest rate of 4.6% to 5% per annum. It's not a bank account, so it's not confirmed interest every month, but it's ultra low risk and it's better than most bank interest rates. Finally, I have my Stash Away General Investing Portfolio, which hold my medium term savings. It's not money for retirement specifically, but it's also not money for any short term goal, where I'll need the money soon. Since I'm looking at a 5-7 to seven year timeline and after weighing the risks and rewards, I've decided to invest these savings instead. If you're interested in Stash Away, I have a partnership with them where you can get your portfolios managed for free for 6 months. Typically, robo-advisors have management fees, right? So yeah, you'll get up to $20,000 managed for free for 6 months with my link, which is more than the usual $10,000 if you sign up on your own. If you remember from the beginning when I showed my income and how I'm expecting $500 in side income as well, but because it's side income and highly variable, I'm also prepared for months where I won't have any side income, which means I'll have $500 less to work with in this budget. How I'm planning for that is to cut back on the following items. I'll reduce my monthly sinking fund from $200 to $100. I'll stop my medium term sinking fund contribution and I'll reduce my holiday fund contribution from $300 to $100. So in total, those cuts amount to $500, but everything else is able to remain the same. This ensures that I'll still be able to make my minimum investment contributions every month, which is as follows. With investing, for now, I always do regular savings plans or monthly contributions, which is what I think is reasonable for most of us to do, unless you have a giant pool of wealth just sitting around, not only does it build that discipline to force yourself to put aside some money every month, but it also takes advantage of dollar cost averaging to mitigate any timing risks. I won't explain too much here, maybe in a future video, but I'll include links in the description if you want to read up more about it. And I like robo-advisors because it's beginner friendly and it's good for passive investing. I'm really not an active investing person. I dislike thinking about investing and the market and the economy in general, so I want something that is minimal effort and automatic. So for 2023, I've decided to put $300 in the Straits Times Index ETF through DBS Investiva and $500 in more global ETFs through StashAway. The one with StashAway, I'm investing through my SRS account. Finally, I have my endowment plan with Prudential. 
Endowment plans are hotly debated in the personal finance scene, and apparently many people seem to think that endowment plans are the devil itself. But in my, perhaps, an uninformed or biased opinion, it's a tool that has its use. If you have a use for it, get the tool. If it has no use for you, then you shouldn't get the tool. How to know if it has a use for you? Ask your financial advisor. For myself, I have it to balance out the risks in my overall portfolio, and there is also a crisis waiver. So if touch wood, I get a critical illness, Prudential will cover my premiums on my behalf. Now, there's also other parts of the template that I use to keep track of other important information, like all my subscriptions and my contract duration for my utilities. For this allocation rule section at the top, I also formatted it so that this column will turn a bright warning red if I fall below or if I exceed some of these categories. So for needs, insurance and wants, if I exceed my target, it will turn red like so. For savings and investments, if I fall below my target, it will turn red. It's quite manual, so if I change the target percentage, I need to change the cell formatting as well. But I think this conditional formatting only works on Google Sheets, not on Microsoft Excel, because I'm not very familiar with Excel, sorry. Just keep that in mind if you want to use my template. It's best used on Google Sheets with a Google account. This template will be linked in the description through a PHIP link and you can download it for free and also donate however much you want. Also, I use this template usually at the end of the previous month, a week before the start of the new month that I'm budgeting for, just like how I'm planning for January at the end of December. Most times, I plan much earlier in the month also. This is because the purpose of this sheet is to plan my overall budget for the month. And once the new month starts and I've input all the numbers in my daily money tracker app, I don't need to look at this sheet again until I have to plan for the next month. The sheet also comes with a net worth tracker, which I've updated slightly from the previous version. I have a video that I made back in January about my net worth, which includes how I use this sheet as well, but I'll probably make an updated one soon since that video is a year old. And that's it for my budget. I feel like it's pretty straightforward, but that's also because I've been staring at the same numbers for over a year now. Do y'all think this is too much or not detailed enough? Let me know what you think. I have other videos on my channel on the tools I use to manage my money. I have a video on my daily money tracking app called Money Lover. Although since that video was posted, I realize a lot of changes have been made to the app, so it's likely that your version of the app won't be the same as mine. But I hope the general principles of how I use the money tracking app will be useful. If you haven't seen my 2023 money goals video, it'll be linked in the description box. I also discussed my philosophy towards money and finances in that video, which would be useful to know in case you're wondering why I'm making certain decisions with my budget. If you'd like to see more of these kinds of videos from me, please subscribe to my channel. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.